told you before, you will find trainees in uh, gastroenterology, also in general surgery, med general medicine, and um, and there will be uh, the faculty of the University of Milan Bicocca. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's a very variegated uh, audience, which makes your talk more even more tricky. <laughs> so. Um, I okay, it's uh, three ten. Uh, probably okay. We should we should start. I can see that all the trainees are all together in the, with the, with the same laptop. So I think we should crack on. So I I, I introduce Jacob, who is uh, uh, he looks young. I think he's very young, and uh, he's uh, he's a physician. He's a gastroenterology trainee, I think, and a scientist based in uh, Aachen and Heidelberg in Germany. Um, is uh, I think he leads a research group uh, focusing application uh, of artificial intelligence in uh, in gastroenterology, and he so he, he leads a group uh, uh, working on computational pathology. He applied his uh, his uh, uh, data scientist skills because I guess he he has a, uh, a background in data science. Uh, probably will tell us more and. Uh, he applied in gastroenterology, specifically in uh, on, uh, gastrointestinal oncology, and he has uh, very well published in the very high profile papers uh, his work on um, colorectal cancer. Um, the reason why we started the collaboration with Jacob is because we are interested in computational pathology applied to liver disease, non oncological liver disease, uh, but I don't think we're going to, we're going to discuss about this today. Uh, so I I don't take any other minutes for you. So I leave you the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco, and um, and thank you for the invitation here. Um, I will share my start sharing my screen. Just a second. Um, here, can you see the presentation? Does it all work? Yes, yeah. you can. Great, wonderful. So. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody also from my side. I'm, I'm Jakob, I'm here from the Department of Gastroenterology in Aachen, Germany. Um, and um, as, as Marco said, my research group is focused on medical image processing. So we apply artificial intelligence, deep learning methods on medical imaging data, mostly histopathology data, but also radiology data and endoscopy image data. What I'm going to show you today is um, related to histopathology mostly. Um, so I'm not a pathologist. Um, that's why I have a really clinical kin clinical point of view on that. And what we want to do is to solve clinically relevant problems. And my presentation will be maybe 25, 30 minutes. You can ask questions anytime. You can interrupt me anytime. And also afterwards, we can have a discussion. Um, so let's get started. And um, by the way, this is our hospital, Aachen University Hospital in the uh, middle of the countryside, very big hospital, liver transplant center, and we do a lot of GI oncology as well here. Um, and um, let's get started with the science. So what um, I am going to show you first is a clinical problem that we were thinking about for, um, for, for a few years now, and that relates to how what data and um, what what exactly we can get out of routine histopathology image data. And so let's consider cancer patients, for example, colon cancer patients who come to the hospital with a suspected cancer and they get a piece of the tumor taken out by surgery or biopsy and that tumor goes for diagnostics to the pathology department. And then a part of the tumor will go for routine histopathology, of course, but another part of the tumor usually goes for genetic testing. So in case of colorectal cancer, MS MSI or BRAF or KRAS mutations, but other mutations for different types of cancer. Um, and then afterwards, we as clinicians, um, together with the pathologists, put together these pieces of information and make a treatment recommendation, for example, for a patient with a metastatic colorectal cancer. The problem here is that these two things are separate diagnostic workflows. So the histology um, is done under a microscope and the genetic um, test is done with a wet lab um, test, for, um, for example, PCR or next generation sequencing or maybe even immunohistochemistry. So 
Um, and of course, this is um, very costly. It can take a lot of time and it's not available in every hospital. So our initial idea for this first project, which I'm going to present to you is what if we could replace this genetic test um, just by looking at the raw histopathology slide. And um, why do we think this is possible? Well, um, because when we think about genetic changes in cancer, we know that these genetic changes change also the appearance of the tumor. They change the phenotype. So the genotype changes the phenotype and um, in multiple ways. So, for example, a specific mutation in the tumor cells um, can change the morphology of the tumor cells. The cells are larger or smaller or the nucleus looks different. Um, and but also in addition to that, we know that uh, specific genetic changes cause changes in the tumor microenvironment or TME. So, for example, some mutations in tumors are immunogenic and more immune cells will invade into the tumor and will. And then when we look at the tumor tissue, um, we can see this even in raw um, routine ATE histopathology slides. And so our idea is that um, by observing all of these changes in um, routine agent E histopathology slides, we can um, guess basically the um, genotype of the cancer. And the computational tool we do to we we use for this task is um, of course deep learning, which I'm going to um, tell you a little bit more in the next few slides. So why do we think this is possible? Well, because these histopathology slides, they are huge and they contain a lot of information. So as you can see here, this is um, Actually, that's a lung adenocarcinoma here, and this is a CT scan from the same patient. And one pixel in the upper Im in the histology image has the same size as one pixel in the radiology image here. So you can see just by the number of image pixels in these images, histology has so much more information than even the whole chest CT series. Um, so these images contain a lot of information which is useful and which we can extract with deep learning. And just to give you an overview of the field, um, um, many, many research groups in the world have, of course, um, realized that these routine histopathology slides contain a lot of information and that um, not only very basic, but also um, very clinically relevant outcomes can be predicted directly from these slides with deep learning. And so a number of um, of publications here um, have focused on just simple tumor detection in agent E slides with the use of deep learning, but other publications, and we have grouped this here in this um, review recently, um, are looking, for example, at treatment response. Can we directly predict treatment response, for example, to immunotherapy directly from agent E slides? Um, other um, publications have looked at overall survival. Can we predict survival directly from these slides and other um, yet other publications have looked at the tumor genotype, and this is what I'm going to talk about um, in the next few slides. And as you can see here, um, this technology really works in a lot of different cancers. So a lot of different publications have shown that in cancers as different as GI tumors, melanoma, lung cancer, um, prostate cancer, etc., um, deep learning can just look at the routine agent E image and, and predict the mutational status of the tumor. Um, so how does this work in practice? Well, these histology images are really large, and so um, we start with this whole slide image, then we cut it into smaller tiles. Essentially, what we do is we create a library of smaller image parts that we can then use for um, for all the subsequent steps. We take these smaller images, we pre-process them, and then we um, use collect these image tiles or image parts from um, a group of patients that we call the training group and another then we train a network on that and then we apply this network to another group of patients which we call the testing testing cohort and if I talk when I talk about networks what do I mean well what we are working with is artificial neural networks. So this is the technology behind um, behind the deep learning. And that's basically like our, and, and that's a very simple model that we can simulate in a computer, in a just, just a normal computer that you may have at home. Um, you can use for that task, um, for some tasks, even your laptop. And um, what this is doing is that um, it simulates the neural, um, 
the, the neural network that we of also, for example, have in our um, in our visual system. So you know, our visual system, starting with the retina up until our visual cortex, is composed of uh, many many millions of neurons which are interconnected and which can transform uh, um, light into something abstract and can enable us to um, to, for example, recognize objects and. Um, and navigate the physical world. And so um, this technology is now pretty um, pretty standard in almost all fields that are related to computational image analysis. You can find this technology in, in autonomous cars, in, um, in, in um, skin cancer classification systems. You can find this technology in Facebook, in face recognition, in um, in, in um, for example, Netflix um, a movie classification. So any any computer-based image or video classification system nowadays works with these neural networks. And we, we also use the same architecture to answer our clinical questions. Um, so let me um, show you some, some of these clinical applications. Well, the first paper in this field that really got things started was published in 2018 by a group in New York where they um, used deep learning to predict mutational status in lung cancer directly from histology slides. And what they did was to um, look at 10, um, 10 mutations in lung cancer, and they showed that six of them they could pr really predict um, from the histology image alone without any genetic test. Our own team did a similar study in 2019, where we looked at colorectal cancer and we showed that microsatellite instability, so a key and um, important genetic feature in colorectal cancer, we can predict from um, histology slides. Um, how many slides do you actually need for this? Well, in these initial publications, only a few hundred patients were used, so 300, 400 patients. Um, but what we've seen over time, and this on the left hand side is from our own study, right hand side is a different study, is that the more patients you train on, the better your performance gets. So for the case of microsatellite instability detection in colon cancer, here we started with 500 um, patients and we increased the numbers until 5,500. And if you um, increase the number of patients, the performance of your diagnostic system also goes up. And um, this is a similar finding from another study um, that um, looked at prostate cancer, only they plotted it the other way around, but also they showed if you train on 100 slides, your error is larger than if you train on 1000 slides. So really these methods are really data hungry. They need a lot of data. They need a lot of patient samples. And that's of course not always really easy to get. And um, what we did for our colorectal cancer projects is to um, found an international consortium um, where we collect these samples um, um, colorectal cancer histology slides with associated clinical and genetic data um, for deep learning based analysis. And um, this was done in the MSI Detect consortium. And now um, we have around 10,000 tumor samples in this consortium. And um, this publication was um, the first publication by this consortium where we showed that by training these systems on um, histology slides from multiple different hospitals, the performance really gets even better and um and um, you can really get a system that is very very good at detecting these msi tumors so we hope of course that this will at some point be used in the clinic of course it's not so easy to go from an academic publication to a clinically usable product and so um we are here um partnering also with companies who are um who are aiming to bring this um, ultimately to the market. And I hope that hopefully in a few years, it will be possible um, once pathology departments are fully digital to, um, to detect um, genetic markers such as microsatellite instability only from the H and E slides. Um, for us as scientists, uh, a very interesting thing is that we, um, don't, we do not only get the predictions for each patient, but we also get predictions in a spatially resolved way. So if we look at these tumors from these patients, um, we can get these prediction heat maps, which tell us which regions in the tumor were mostly associated with high, with in this case, MSI versus MSS. And so um, 
and so these um these these methods can really also select regions in the tumors which might be important or associated with a given endpoint and um Another student from my group um, applied these methods to bladder cancer and the prediction of FGFR3 mutations. So for all of you who are not um, working with bladder cancer every day, um, so FGFR3 mutations are um, um, one of the most common mutations in bladder cancer and they are targetable now with the clinical inhib um, clinically approved um, um, inhibitor, um, small molecule drug. And so, um, what um, we did here was, well, once we used the deep learning system to predict the FGFR3 mutational status in bladder cancer from histology, and this worked pretty well. And then we looked at the tumor heterogeneity because we found some cases where we had this very heterogeneous prediction map. So you can see here on the right-hand side, the top part of the tumor was predicted to be mutated. It was yellow in this case, and the bottom part of the tumor was predicted to be non-mutated. And then we verified this by um, in the original tumor tissue by micro, micro dissecting the tissue and testing the um, different regions. And we found that indeed the upper half of this tumor was mutated and the lower half was not mutated. So these methods maybe even have an advantage over the conventional genotyping methods in that they can give us um, spatially resolved predictions. And um, um, another project that um, Peter, one of my um, postdocs, who's also a, a medical doctor, um, is doing is to improve these algorithms further. And this is uh, um, just a glimpse of his project, which will hopefully be published really soon, where he again looks at microsatellite instability status in um, in colorectal cancer, and he combines this with automatic automatic tumor detection in the in the slides. Um, which again improves the classification performance a little bit. So um, what I just showed you is um, different examples for clinically interesting situations where um, deep learning can detect a particular mutation in the tumor tissue. And what we have seen in 2020 was um, a number of publications that really looked at what is the limit of these um, what is the limit of these methods? Can we apply this really to any tumor type and to any mutation? And one of these publications um, was from our team where we showed, where we looked at colorectal cancer again and all other cancers um, that, um, well, um, 12 or so of the most common cancers. And um, we um, collected hundreds of pathology slides for each of these cancers um, and checked um, from the gold standard genome sequencing data um, which mutations we could predict from histopathology. And um, just to give you the, um, the bottom line of this publication, for approximately two thirds of all the genes that we looked at, we could not predict the genetic status from the histology, but for actually one third of all the genes we looked at, it, this was possible. And in colorectal cancer, the candidate genes where this was actually possible to a high degree were included some clinically relevant candidates, such as PIK3CA, KRAS, BRAF, P53, et cetera. Um, at the same time, another team published um, in the same issue actually of Nature Cancer published the same findings where they also looked at all the different types of cancers. They looked at all different types of genetic mutations and, and checked if they can predict them from histology. And they made a similar finding about one third of all the genetic mutations were predictable from histopathology. And what they did was also to um, to identify spatial patterns. So again, I'm not a pathologist. Um, so, um, so, um, so um, these patterns. I mean, um, um, they look all more or less the same, right? But um, no, really, what you can you can in some cases, for example, here these were like patterns that were observed in BRAF mutant thyroid cancers, whereas these patterns were observed in BRAF wild type thyroid cancers, and so there are difference between the groups, which even might help pathologists at some point. And this is another study which was actually published also at the same time in Nature Communications, where a team from France showed that they can um, basically do the same thing across multiple cancer types and predict the gene expression in this case for all, all um, for a large number of, um, of genes. Um, 
And among the tumors where this method worked the best were lung cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, head and neck cancer. Um, so very clinically relevant tumor types. Okay, so I talked a lot about cancer, um, but I promised also to put some of the non um, non cancer results from our group in this in 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 this presentation. The problem is that in, in tumor diseases, of course, there's a lot of di diagnostic data available. We always have histopathology, and we all almost always have genetic testing. Um, to apply these methods to non-tumor diseases is a little bit more challenging because um, the data is not so abundant and the tissue is not so abundant. But we, what we did was to identify a clinical situation where we have a lot of tissue and that is um, related to kidney transplantation. So our hospital is um, also a kidney transplant center. And so these um, patients often after transplantation, they get a... Um, if if a um, allograft rejection is suspe um, suspected, they get a kidney biopsy, and then on this biopsy, pathologists will make the diagnosis of um, graft rejection or not. And um, and what we did was to collect from our own hospital, but also from two hospitals in the Netherlands, so from Amsterdam and um, Utrecht, um, we collected in total. Um, in in total, a few thousand um, a few thousand slides of kidney post transplant biopsies that were um, that were diagnosed as either reject graft rejection or no rejection, and trained deep learning classifiers um, to predict that um, diagnosis. And actually, this worked pretty well. And also, what was possible to look at these biopsies and tell which regions in the biopsies. Um, are most predictive of the um, transplant rejection status. Um, so, of course, it would be really cool to um, to also do something like this in, in liver diseases. And, um, and together with Marco, um, we are actually actively working, working on this. So hopefully soon there will be um, also some results for um, different um, liver diseases in this case. So um, that's actually it. I'm almost um, done with the presentation. So all the um, all the um, all the um, reports of what was done in the past um, are um, are finished now. What I would like to point out is two more things. One, what are the next steps for this research field? And two, how can we as medical doctors get started in this field? So let me start with um, the next steps. Um, of course, one big driver of this um, field is technological innovation. And recently we have seen a number of papers from groups, mostly from the US who have used more um, newer deep neural network architecture for different, for, for very specific tasks and, and um, which yielded a very good performance. So this field is progressing and we um, like almost every few weeks, we see a, um, a high profile paper from this field of computational pathology out. Um, and of course we are also using in our team, these newer technologies nowadays. One thing that is always a problem is that um, data it cannot be so easily shared. So one aspect um, that we are working on is to um, to find out how can we share data and preserve the um, the patient's an anonymity. And so um, in this project, which was just published a few weeks ago, what we did was to train a specific type of type of neural networks that we call generative models, and um, to create synthetic image data. So really fake image data that has not been, that did not come from a patient, but was generated by a neural network. And um, and if you want to read more about that, here's the citation, basically what, um, what was done um, is that we collected a large number of patients, then we trained a network to learn how these patients look like, and this could then generate new images that looked very similar to the original images, but were really um, not present in the original data set, but they were really new or synthetic images. And these images can, of course, be shared much easier across institutions. And of course, in the very beginning, I showed you that histopathology images are much have a much higher information density than radiology image, which is why we prefer to work with histopathology images. However, 
a number of publications have shown that even from raw histo from raw radiology images, um, interesting features about the tumor can be predicted, including the mutational status. And in this case, for example, the KRAS mutational status in colorectal cancer. And this is part of the field of radiomics, which probably, which is now pretty commonplace. Um, and um, and and ultimately, what we are, um, what what would be really cool to have is a system that combines the radiology images and the histopathology images to give, um, to give a prediction, for example, about prognosis or about genetic alterations. And um, let me now go to the very very last part of the talk, which is um, key ingredients for computational pathology. So the question really is how can how can clinicians um, or how can anyone get started in the field? And this field is really new. So digital image processing, of course, has been around for decades, but um, computational pathology, um, deep learning based image analysis in pathology and other medical medical um, imaging types has only been around for 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 a few years. So how so it's still possible to somehow get started in this field and the question is how what do you need for this and for of course the first um thing but also the least important thing is computer hardware so what we did here was to just buy a bunch of computers with these um, graphics cards that can be used to process these data and train the models and compared to a wet lab infrastructure compared to centrifuge and thermocyclers and mouse facilities and all of that these computers are of course really really cheap so this type of research is actually a really really cheap um to perform and really easy to get started um, from the point of equipment. Well, the second thing that you need to get started is, of course, to have the right algorithms and that's the right computer programs. And also that is not too hard. And nowadays there is a number of different um, um, software platforms available where you can do this deep learning based image analysis. Some of them even do not require any programming, but of course, usually it is very, very much um, helpful to um, to um, to be able to write computer programs. But this is even for, I mean, for medical doctors, this is completely realistic and completely doable. And this is not really, not really hard, um, not really hard to learn, especially with newer um, software platforms such as FastAI, um, which plays a big um, emphasis also on the training on the um, all open, open online courses. Um, well, the third ingredient that you need to get started in this field is data. And I showed you before that we, for the colorectal cancer projects, we collected a lot of data in this international consortium. Um, ideally, um, data becomes more more valuable even if you only not only have histology but only radiology, clinical, and genetic data, and um, and this is um, of course um, mostly possible in academic consortia where you where different medical centers collaborate and share the data, and. Um, and the fourth and I think most important ingredient is interdisciplinary young scientists. So in my team, we have um, a number of medical students, medical doctors, but also engineering PhD students, biologists who all um, learn these methods. And of course the engineers um, already know programming, but they don't know the clinical application. Um, the clinicians, they know the clinical application, but they don't know maybe the computer side so well. And so our aim and my aim really is to train interdisciplinary young scientists in this um, in this intersection of these fields and one of these one of the events we had just before corona in london last year was this um um, um one week workshop about computational pathology where we met with um, research groups from across europe and um and worked together um in smaller groups on um on problems in computational pathology and that was a lot of fun and i hope we can resume this very soon um as well. So if you want to learn more about our research, you can check our website www.carta.ai. And um, this is my um, my team. So um, here we are based in Aachen in, in Germany. Um, we but we are a really international team with medical students, medical doctor, engineers and biologists 
and um, we always, of course, have open positions for visiting medical doctors, PhDs, postdoc, master students. So feel free to send me an email. And now, um, that's it. Thank you very much for for listening. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Jacob. I think you should stop the sharing. Okay. Mm, there we go. Can I? Okay. Can I? Ask Thank you, you about Jacob. It, it was a very beautiful overview on our, all the uh, um, in the computational pathology field and the uh, opportunity that offers and uh, and uh, it is a very you know transversal uh, field. Uh, that require many, you know, uh, several skills in the in the same group or in the same person in your case. Um, so I will have many questions, but I think I will I will uh, leave the of the audience to 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 make question to. Is there any question? Yes, I do have one. Okay, Professor Catoretti. Yeah, um, I'm a pathologist, one of the few in the audience. Um, beautiful. Uh, fantastic, uh, very useful and helpful. Uh, you, if I'm wrong, you did the never mention once uh, discovery in your talk. And to go straight to the point, uh, um, common cancer are coming in at, in at least uh, three flavors. One is uh, microsatellite instability, and the other two are different uh, by the number of chromosomal aberrations, uh, you should uh, uh, you should have found those other two subtypes, and if you did not find, why? Yes, a um, very very interesting, very relevant question. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually. Um, yeah, actually, there, as you said, there are different subtyping systems for colorectal cancer, and one is also the consensus molecular subtype, which is even four, four subtypes, chromosomally, um, well, genome stable, microsatellite instable, and then highly stromal um, tumor type. So we, um, we see, of course, that we can not only detect the MSI tumors, but also some of these other, um, some of these other subtype, molecular subtypes, but um, um, really not to such a, with such a high performance. And why is that? Well, because we don't have the training data for, we have now 10,000 colon cancers where the microsatellite instability has been determined. But regarding these other subtypes, um, there is really not much data and we only have 300 or so patients from the public TCGA archive to work with. So um, I think this really highlights the problem that um, to discover other subtypes except MSI, um, um, we really need a lot of good training data where we have the images and they were tested also with the gold standard method so we can check if we are right or not. Other questions? Uh, Marco, may I ask, uh, um, so thinking about the non-cancer diseases and, uh, and, and tissues, so with Marco and other here in, uh, in Monza, we, we discuss a lot, we are still discussing. So we, the, the, the first easy question and naive question is, but if we uh, would help the, the algorithm, looking for or actually finding something um, to stains uh, in uh, for some specific cells for example you know i'm talking about uh, uh, P pbc or ih uh, autoimmune hepatitis so we know that some cells are typical and peculiar features of the disease uh, in the liver and uh, and uh, and so the 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 the, uh, the geography of cells of different cells immune cells and uh, but uh, if, if you stay by hematosilinosine you you just have i mean how to train the algorithm i mean it's uh, so in the the uh, as, as clinician or expert in this uh, 
features of disease, uh, we would like to to explain the algorithm something, and we know it's not the the, the right approach because uh, in in theory you expect that the algorithm uh, finds something that the, uh, our uh, minds uh, is, is is not able and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, to 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 find out. So uh, the question is. Uh, I mean, I have a number of questions, but the, one of the easiest one is: uh, uh, Would stainings of of uh, with different for different cells, uh, or or for fibrosis, or what some mm -hmm. uh, uh, stainings of features, like say more in general, would help? Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that that mm -hmm. is the first one. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, extremely relevant question. So, as you said, um, in ideally, the algorithm should be able to find all of these patterns, and we should not be required to put our prior expert knowledge into this. For example, also in the cancer field, we know that some um, morphological changes are related to genetic changes, but in all of our studies, we never informed the algorithm about that. We just gave it the raw image data and it had to figure out everything by itself. And usually this works best. It works uh, really the best results you get if you do not put any constraints on the algorithm, you just let it detect all the features by itself. And sometimes it will come up with known features um, and that, that you expect. And sometimes it will come up with unexpected features that we don't don't expect to see. And this is, of course, very interesting um, from a clinical point of view. However, in order for this to work, you need, of course, enough samples and the samples need to have enough information. And so in the cancer projects, we have 10,000 tumors and these tumors are large. They are one by one centimeter. So it's really a lot of tissue and it's easy for the algorithm to learn it. And what we were really um, seeing in our projects with the liver biopsies is that all, quite often we have less than 100 patients and then the biopsies are small so it's almost impossible for the system to detect everything by itself and indeed it in these cases it makes sense to maybe help the system and to guide it guide it to relevant structures for example use immunostains for um, for immune cell subtypes or for stromal structures that that highlight highlight uh, stru tissue structures that we know are important um ultimately i think we should do both things we should um for very specific clinical questions, we should somehow try to help the computer a little bit by performing specific stains, but also we should try to just collect as much data as possible to enable the computers to find their own patterns. And this can be, of course, routine histopathology, agent E slides, but also radiology images, or maybe all of it combined, um, ultimately. Great, thank you. So it's fascinating, actually, the, the technology is opening uh, some the, really the, the, the impact of these, uh, I think, would be great. Of course, we, we need to produce the, 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 the teaching, teaching. I, I, we, in the future, I think that uh, I don't know if I'm wrong, but uh, we need to have a trained computer. And then uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the bedside, you need a, a very well trained and, and a, a computer to make your clinical activities easier. So a larger number in this phase, mm -hmm. larger yes, as possible. And that at the end, it, that, that is, is not relevant for the, the, the clinical application in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my easy mind, uh, would not be so relevant at that time when we had that time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are still a little bit away from real clinical application in these yeah. methods. I mean, nothing, none of these methods is currently clinically um, approved in Europe, but I think this will probably, we will see in the next five, 10 years that this will definitely change and make an impact in, on the clinic. And I think it should be 
us as clinicians who really shape this field and not just technology companies who do not know the clinical um, the clinical needs. If I can, the last the last naive question. Yeah. All of them are naive, but uh, from my side, of one hundred percent. But um, you are expert in this in this uh, area, and uh, what uh, I, I'm thinking about algorithms. Now, now we have a number of algorithms, and and uh, and different companies produce their own algorithms, and even scientists and. Uh, do you see different or are you expecting differences in in uh, in performance among alto algorithm or 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 not no not really so really all the algorithms are basically the same and also from what i am aware in all the publications everyone uses basically the same technology with minor modifications and also the commercial products that are coming to the market, um, they are also based on the same technology. So really the limiting factor is not, I think it's not the algorithm, but your limiting factor is to have the right clinical, um, the right clinical idea, the right clinical hypothesis and, 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 and good data. Great, so we don't need to um, spend energy in, uh, in developing a better algorithm as a scientist approaching the field, but just having larger and larger possible samples. Yes, and, and to ask the right questions. So really the, right. the most um, um, the most um, fulfilling projects are the ones where you ask a question, you just take an existing algorithm and it answers your question really fast. Okay. Uh, Jacob, yeah. Prego. Can I? Can I have an, another more technical question? As you know, I think uh, Markovitz applied the CGTA frozen section uh, for AI classification. And frozen sections are terrible by morphology. Mm -hmm. uh, and you correctly pointed out uh, to the amount of information which is inside the whole slide image, uh, uh, which usually is acquired at uh, 20x, uh, so 200 times magnification. Uh, so my question is, how much um, uh, detail uh, is required and the system goes into? Um, and I'm, I'm aiming at uh, uh, single cell biology. So uh, I don't know if you, if you get the, the, the point where I'm aiming at. Yes, so of course, more to have more detail is usually helpful and especially so all, most of the published works are 20x scanned FFPE um, surgical specimens. And so once we move to biopsies, we have far less tissue. So maybe 40x is better, but we it has not really been tested in the literature. And also, of course, frozen tissue is not as good as FFPE tissue. But on the other hand, there are a few publications that use frozen tissue and they get surprisingly good results. Um, so, yeah. So that's absolutely an important important consideration because there is this garbage in garbage out um, um, idea, right? If you have garbage data, you will get garbage prediction in the end. Um. Jacob, uh, I have a question. So we are um, so we we are very focused on on. Uh, uh, a part of our group is focused on liver disease, specifically rare liver disease. Mm -hmm. And we got the, the frustration of um, lacking two main uh, ingredients that you proposed. So one is the, the data, because, you know, uh, we don't prefer, you know, for cancer, you need the, the you know, the histological confirmation for mm -hmm. um, uh, autoimmune liver diseases, you you don't biopsy all patient class. It's a rare disease, so it's difficult to build up data. Um, and uh, the second thing that you test these, uh, uh, you know, the morphological patterns towards endpoints, we, you know, you need a clear cut endpoints, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you know, rejection, uh, survival, uh, and the autoimmune diseases, you know, it's a very, 
uh, uh, let's say novel field and we we still have not clear cut definition of treatment response uh, or uh, phenotypes so it, it's it's difficult so one field that will be where you know a non oncological gastrointestinal field where it will be useful the application of computational pathologies uh, you know i mean uh, you know, like NAFLD or mm -hmm. uh, I won't say viral hepatitis is too late now, but you know, uh, parenchymal disease like uh, uh, NAFLD, also autoimmune liver diseases, um, autoimmune hepatitis. I mean, and um, uh, the, the kind of question I would expect from uh, uh, your algorithms will be um, both uh, um, one on prediction of uh, of. Uh, uh, res treatment response survival this is progression uh, one also like uh, uh, you know some description that provide you know uh, the generate hypothesis in terms of phenotypes uh, I mean this is as a non-expert in in the field uh, this is what I would expect you know uh, some novel information about the patterns of uh, uh, you know fibrosis distribution biliary you know biliary damage uh, ductal reaction, uh, the 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 inflammatory infiltrates, how he, he is distributed in the mm -hmm. in the lobules. So I would expect that uh, a clever algorithm will provide me information about that, and uh, uh, that uh, can be correlated with the clinical data about the phenotype. Um, so I just wonder whether you because we we briefly chatted about you know application in no, in non oncological liver diseases. Have you, have you explored that or are you planning to do so? Yes, I think, I mean, what you said are the very, very important points. It's um, to really use these methods. What you need is enough data, high quality data, and then clear endpoints. And in, as you said, in most of these diseases, it's not so easy to define an endpoint. And this is why a lot of clinical brains i think has to a clinical expertise has to go into that and somehow um somehow define these endpoints and then use it to um, train the ai system because the systems are much more powerful when you train them directly on these endpoints if you can somehow say um progression of the disease after one year or stability of the disease after one year. If you have any way to measure that and to define that, and then you train the system directly on this endpoint, this is um, much, much more powerful usually than if you train the system to detect bile ducts and somehow quantify the bile ducts and everything. Because if you train on the endpoint directly, it should automatically learn um, all the rest on the way. So we we prefer usually to train on the endpoint, but as you said, that's um, that's clinically re really challenging. And maybe even these data sets are non-existent at the moment. But then what we should do is to try to prospectively collect this and try to prospectively through maybe um, professional societies and European um, collaboration um, try also maybe in clinical trials to try to collect as much suitable data as possible so later on that we can apply these algorithms um, on it and also think about the good good clinical endpoints which are non not really established for most of the diseases that we are interested in here yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, okay, it looks there are no other questions around. Pietro? Audio, Pietro. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry. Uh, I was just asking to students. Okay, we had a nice uh, discussion. I think uh, if I had to close, I thank you a lot. It uh, was really interesting and uh, we hope to have uh, an update uh, soon also, not, not only in cancer, but in, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, uh, in other diseases, not cancer diseases, but any uh thank you very much it was very very thank interesting and thank, thank you, you very much thank you very much thank you bye bye, bye. have a good bye. day mm -hmm.
Va bene, everyone. Devi spegnere il tuo. Sì. Thank you.